Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third day of 93rd Annual Convention and AGM of Vicky. When we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too. With this positive note, I welcome you all to join us at the session on Leveraging ICT for Economic Revival in Post-COVID-19 Era. Accounting for 15%, digital transformation is an integral part of global GDP. And ICT is one of the most powerful sources shaping the 21st century in terms of socio-economic development. And emerging technologies like AI is going to play a huge role in this. With this, I would now request Mr. Dilip Shunai, Secretary General Fiki, to introduce Dr. Eric Shemit. Good morning and welcome to the third day of the Fiki Annual Convention. Information and communication technologies are rapidly shaping the world around us. They're impacting the economies and society at large. Now that we are advancing in the later stages of the fourth industrial revolution, it is very crucial that we leverage imaging technologies like AI and machine learning tools to ensure growth and innovation. With this, I would like to request Dr. Eric Smith for his address. Dr. Eric Smith is an accomplished technologist, entrepreneur, philanthropist. He joined Google in 2001 and helped grow the company from a Silicon Valley startup to a global leader in technology alongside founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Under his leadership, Google dramatically scaled its infrastructure and diversified its product offerings while maintaining a strong culture of innovation. Currently, Dr. Schmidt is serving as the chairman of the National Security Commission on AI, which is known as NSCAI. Dr. Schmidt, please. And I really want to thank the, I'll just say it, the, the FICI, uh, group, as well as the Carnegie Endowment for organizing this event and bringing us here today. It's really great to be alongside Satya, Raja, Kareem, and I obviously look forward to the Prime Minister's remarks right after. Um, I'm here in the capacity of the chair of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. This commission was created by the United States Congress to consider the methods and means necessary to advance the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to comprehensively address the national security and defense needs of the United States. I'm speaking, of course, in my position as the NSCAI chair today. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the centrality of AI in our shared future and the importance of the United States pursuing AI developments through a lens of partnerships and in particular, a partnership involving the United States and India, who I respect, admire, and really, really believe India will be part of the, the story for all of us, and in particular for the United States. So AI is a game changer. It's the most powerful tool in generations for expanding knowledge, increasing prosperity, enriching the human experience, and expanding freedom. All science and, and engineering efforts will leverage AI. It'll be the foundation of the innovation economy and a source of enormous power for those who harness it, companies and nations. I feel an urgency to get AI right. I, I must say that my, my sense of urgency is amplified because of broader economic and strategic developments. You cannot ignore these trends in the international landscape. The United States competitors see power in AI in similar terms. And they're using it for different reasons or different means. Uh, China is rapidly becoming an AI peer in many areas and has concerted plans to invest, research, and lead in AI. It's also no surprise that Russia is developing AI for military uses, along with China, who has used AI as part of disinformation campaigns, which, of course, you could imagine what that does to us. So what's the nature of the problem? We're now in an AI-charged technology competition fusing economic competitiveness, great power rivalry, a contest between authoritarianism and democracy. In other words, we're right in the middle now. And I wanted to sort of suggest four points. The first, which I think is obvious to our Indian friends, is that America and the United States alone will not work. Strong AI partnerships will be important to all aspects of the competition. The United States, with its current and political partners, potential partners, 
must use the moment to renew their commitment to protecting individual rights, restoring commercial competition built on fair rules, and strengthening defense alliances that have kept the peace in Europe and in the Pacific for 75 years. I don't want to lose that. Second, look, I think partnerships are not easy. AI presents genuine conundrums from U.S. partners. Many are conflicted about America's tech dominance, looking to avoid getting trampled in a superpower competition, and they want to forge their own AI futures anyway. Notably, privacy concerns, fear of economic dependence uh, encourage European leaders to assert their technological sovereignty. In the Indo-Pacific, China's looming presence presents obstacles to deepening ties among democracies. Many states are leery about publicly choosing sides. This is a problem. Third, a, sh a shared sense of about China is building. The issues that divide us must not overwhelm the principles that unite us. Many states now see the strategic threat of building their digital future on Chinese infrastructure. They recognize the nature and magnitude of the risk posed by the Chinese companies harvesting data in service of the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. And like us, they abhor China's use of AI to supercharge surveillance, oppress minority groups, and impose ideological conformity. Fourth, partnership must be about a positive AI agenda. The AI futures that our partners yearn are not so different from what Americans seek. The development of AI can be a shared, shared endeavor, if you will, for a shared benefit. Research collaboration, pools of data to define refine algorithms, principles for employing AI tools ethically and responsibly all benefit from our collective thought and action. And this is especially true for democracies who need to be more united than we are. Uh, I visited India last year with Dr. Kissinger, and I continue to be amazed by the potential of your people and technology. India is a great partner today. It'll be critical and a stronger partner tomorrow. India is a natural centerpiece of a coalition of democracies and a stronger bilateral partner. It possesses a thriving innovation economy, tremendous tech talent, shared democratic values, and a common interest in building a bulwark against authoritarianism in the Indo-Pacific region. Again, we have alignment here. The United States and India have a strong science and technology relationship. In the past two decades, the countries have been working closely on cyber, on information and tech communications technology, and in other areas. And in each of these areas, the dialogue has expanded in terms of quantity and quality. The, the U.S. and India have also been partners in leading international forums around the development of, of this in international normative and technical standards for AI and associated technologies, which is crucial for our development of all of this. Beyond the S&T context, there are growing connections between the two nations, India and the United States, around our shared security concerns. There's something called the quadrilateral security dialogue among the United States, India, Japan, and Australia, which seems to be gaining strength. In October of this year, the nation's leaders met at the U.S.-India 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue, where all the parties welcomed the elevation of this comprehensive global strategic partnership, which is vital in my view, and I think in the United States' view, to security and stability in the region and in the world. But we think that there is room to grow, and we believe that it's imperative that these nations work together to address these geopolitical challenges and rapid advances, advancements, if you will, in AI and emerging tech. So as part of this, the commissioners and I in our AI, uh, AI commission have recently proposed a formal U.S.-India strategic tech alliance, literally a formal activity of the U.S. government, to develop a regional tech strategy and collaborate on joint research and development projects talent exchanges, aligning our regulatory regimes, and using AI to address common societal concerns. Um, the Commission sees the Tech Alliance as a critical step in the strategic focus or refocus of U.S. policy in the Indo-Pacific region around emerging technology with India as its focal point. The Tech Alliance would build on the already strong relationship that we already have between the two largest democracies 
and focus on developing and implementing a strategy for, for emerging technology in this region. We recommend that this tech alliance involve periodic high-level meetings to develop an overarching strategy on issues involving the emerging technology in the region. It would be supplemented with regular working groups to develop concrete operational venues for cooperation in the way that would be obvious. But I would suggest advanced joint research and development projects around AI, talent exchanges and talent flows, a range of issues on innovation, including emergency technology investment, uh, emerging technology investment, excuse me, aligning export controls, investment screening, and intellectual property rights, and the development of AI for societal application, and of course, using AI to counter disinformation. That list is a pretty good list for us to start with. We've also asked the United States Department of State to partner with India's Ministry of External Affairs to hold an inaugural high-level meeting and to use that meeting to agree on a contact on a concrete agenda, if you will, for collaboration. We also recommend that the U.S. government pursue formal AI cooperation agreements in the overall region, the Indo-Pacific region. This includes deepening the cooperation that the U.S., Australia, India, and Japan have through this quad that I mentioned earlier. This recommendation builds on the growing support for the quadrilateral security dialogue and the other nations in the Pacific region to focus on AI cooperation for both defense and security purposes. There's so many areas in which the two countries can deepen their collaboration. We think it would be particularly fruitful to examine joint R&D in advanced AI applications, talent ex exchanges, aligning investment screening and export control regulations, coordinating on patent protections, and exploring ways to create and use AI tools to counter disinformation and help address social needs. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in Bangalore, as you know, because of Google and before that because of Novell. And I know that there's tremendous talent and tremendous teams working between India and the United States already. I'd like to make those recommendations and collaborations stronger and more formal. Let me conclude that my optimism in this alliance is anchored in my faith of how America approaches the world. A U.S. call for partnership is not a demand for subservience. American interests are best served by leading voluntary co coalitions. Literally, what is best for India? What is best for America? I think that they're in alignment. It's a natural peer relationship. So these opportunities for partnerships, scientific, educational, commercial, and military are boundless. The opportunity drive, let's say it differently, the opportunity that is driven by AI is anchored in the American creed. As John F. Kennedy said, diversity and independence, far from being opposed to the American conception of world order, represent the very essence of our view of the future of the world. I really look forward to the rest of the discussion today. Thank you all and enjoy the show. Thank you, uh, Eric, uh, for that excellent uh, address. Uh, of course, you covered the Indo-US relationship. You also talked about the need for an architecture for cooperation between uh, the US and India and the need for joint R&D. Uh, I really value your optimism, optimism in, in this whole voluntary alliance to address the challenges of uh, artificial intelligence uh, and ICT going forward. It was a pleasure having you with us, but the formal uh, word of thanks will be done by Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, uh, President Fiki. Um, we are waiting for the Honorable Minister to join us, so we will uh, continue the session once the uh, minister uh, joins us uh, later uh, in a few minutes. So thank you. We have amongst us the visionary leader whose guidance has established India as a global standard for digital transformation. Sri Ravi Sankar Prasad, Honorable Minister for Law and Justice, Communications and Electronics, and Information Technology, Government of India. Before we hear the Honorable Minister, I request Mr. Sudhir Jalan, Past President Fiki and Chairman Neo Foods Private Limited to kindly deliver the welcome address. Good morning, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome the Honorable Minister of Law, 
justice, communication, electronics, and information technology of the government of India, Sri Ravi Shankar Prashad. It is indeed an honor, sir, and privilege to have you with us at the FICI's 93rd annual session. Sir, under your dynamic leadership and tremendous efforts, the ICT and digital economy sectors of India continue to move forward, forward at a very scorching pace and have reached new heights in the global arena. With more than 700 million internet subscribers, India ranks as world's second largest market in terms of total internet users, as well as app economy. May it be an expo exponential growth in digital payment system or rapidly increasing electronics manufacturing units over the last few years, we have witnessed tremendous growth in the information and communication technology sector. The achievements of your ministry, especially during the difficult year 2020, would be incomplete without noting the leadership role that you and your officers have played in delivering the PLI scheme for electronics manufacturing. The scheme has already started delivering results. Further, it has become the role model on which, based on which the scheme has come on 10 other sectors which have been uh, allocated PLI budgets. This is pioneering and seminal work that you have led with a horizon period of five years. We would also like to congratulate you for the recent launch of PM Wi-Fi Access Network Interface to unleash a massive Wi-Fi network in India. Ravi Babu, we are sure that PM Wani will not only create employment, but also enhance disposable incomes in the hands of the small and medium entrepreneurs and boost the GDP of the country. Ladies and gentlemen, this year has been very difficult for the nation. As also for the world, we are facing global health crisis, COVID-19, which is attacking societies at the core. The financial and social loss caused by COVID-19 is unprecedented. However, we should take this opportunity to establish India as a hub of technology innovation and manufacturing. And the vision of Atma Nirbhar Bharat is a timely step in the right direction. In this rapidly evolving digital era, data is the core of every information, acting as a catalyst of growth and economic revival. As a nation, we must identify the new innovative ways forward to become a competitive digital economy to surpass the global leaders. The government has already initiated its efforts toward building a robust data protection framework and PIKI as an industry chamber, along with its members, will be happy to work with the government of India for the same. We assure you, sir, that PIKI will work with the government for the growth and development of our nation. May I request you now, the Honorable Minister, to share your vision Plus. Thank you. Uh, respected Sudhir Babu, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, good friend Uday Shankar. It is nice to talk to the FIKI convention digitally during these challenging times. I have been attending all your functions physically, but this is indeed indicating of the times we are in. But every challenge also offers a great opportunity. Before I outline that as to what we did, how we handled the challenges of the COVID, very briefly may I convey to this August gathering as to how the digital India ecosystem which we conceived, which we finalized, which we sought to put on the ground, created a great enabling atmosphere to face the challenge of COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, Digital India simply put it designed to empower ordinary Indians with the power of technology. Most important, bridging the digital divide 
and bringing in digital inclusion, as we say in Hindi, Samaveshi Digital Bharat Bazaar. And this must be achieved through technology which is homegrown, developmental, and low cost. As Sudhir Babu said, India population of 1.3 billion plus, 1.2 billion mobile phone, 1.26 billion Aadhaar card. By leveraging all this with the Jandhan account, how we created a new ecosystem of delivery of welfare bill. In 440 government schemes, nearly government of India and states, we have delivered 13 lakh crore in the last five and a half years to the bank account of the poor, Manrega payment, gas connections subsidy, food subsidy, etc. You know how much we have saved? 1,70,000 crores, which used to be pocketed by middlemen and fictitious claimants. During this COVID, we sent close to 70,000 crores in the bank account of the needy, which was required to help them overcome this crisis. We have sent close to 1 lakh crore to 10 crore farmers in the entire Kisan Samman Nidhi, whereby they give the 6,000 rupees every year, 2,000 every quarter. The inclusive character of digital India, which we had conceived, could ultimately reach the common people's life through digital delivery without any middle. When the COVID came, the issue posed a serious challenge. And then we came with the idea of work from home. There was a lot of uh, issue of uh, regulatory requirements, issue of financial requirements. I said, remove all this. I don't want work of Indian IT BPM industry to suffer. And today, 85% of India's IT industry continue to work from home. And now we have finalized it. PM said, make it permanent. And now you can work from anywhere. So this is a great uh, support which we could give to the IT industry during these challenging times. And the whole world is applauding that. Thereafter, digital education, digital payment, I just wanted to give one particular instance to the friends. In the UPI transactions in the month of November 2020 has hit an all-time high of 2.21 billion transactions worth 3.90 lakh crores. So India is emerging as a big fintech industry. UPI again homegrown. Aadhaar again created by Indian scientists. This whole GSTN, again created by Indian entrepreneurs. Ayushman Bharat, the digital payment of 5 lakh to the needy people of the country for medical health care, again being managed digitally. The Prime Minister announcing from the ramparts of Red Fort on the 15th of August, I want to have a digital health identity card for every Indian. Now you see the entire ecosystem. Digital public platforms being created with the effort of Indian entrepreneurs, Indian mind, Indian industry, homegrown, low cost, and delivering all the entitlement to the people of the country. Therefore, when I'm talking to the friends of the FIKI, they need to know that what we had conceived in 2015, Digital India program when we launched, has now come on the ground. We also needed digital infrastructure to reinforce that. Uh, you know that we have taken BharatNet to 2,50,000 Gram Panchayats of India. The Prime Minister takes suggestion from all of us on the 15th of August. Then we decided to convey to him gently that let us go to all the six lakh villages of India of Little Five. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi is a great visionary leader, as you all know. He immediately decided that under his care, roads are reaching all the villages of India. 
electricity has reached all the villages of India. It is right time optical fiber must reach all the villages of India. And he has given a hard task from the rampant of Red Fort on the 15th of August last year, this year, that within 1,000 days, we shall reach optical fiber to all the 6 lakh villages of India. It has already commenced from Bihar, where 45,000 villages are to be linked by coming April, May. And we are fast-tracking that. Sudhir Babu, you talked of Vani, this public Wi-Fi network. What is this? Like a PCO, which was launched in 80s. The country needs Wi-Fi. And this will be an arrangement where a grocery shop owner a simple tea stall vendor or a small uh, shopkeeper or a small public office can have the facility of a Wi-Fi network and mind you, without any license, without any registration or without any registration. They can take their connections of internet from anyone and there will be an aggregator who will be coordinating the activities in the defined and then there will be an app whereby Indian app economy, as you rightly pointed out, is almost the second biggest in the world. Now, kindly see from fiber to all the villages of India to public Wi-Fi available everywhere to in India being the lowest data cost available in the whole world nearly. The entire digital ecosystem is rising very fast. But as the minister in charge, it is close to six years plus that I have been handling the IT ministry and again communication. And I was also the communication minister. I had laid one ground rule very clearly to my officers. Digital India must become a mass movement. Unless the ordinary people of the country have a stake in the process, it will not succeed. Uh, we have a platform, Common Service Centers. I would like Fiki friends to know about it. These are digital kiosks who are giving digital delivery of services from your land records to having your railway ticket to filling up the forms, etc., etc. They were closing 75, 80,000 when we had come to power. I have taken that to 3 lakh 75,000. 12 lakh boys and girls are working there. Now they have become a parallel center of digital delivery all over the country. They are also involved in economic survey. As a law minister, I have also put them at the front end of free litigation advice to common people in the hinterland of India. Many of them are doing skilling. Many of them are delivery pensions. In this COVID, I asked them to do something unique. They opened e gramin stores to supply the daily wares to the people. Now we have close to uh, 1 lakh 36 thousand e gramin stores. And I'm happy to share with you that they have done a business of close to 150 crores. That is the digital potential available in the country if we involve the common people. Uh, Again, I am telling you, this whole movement is going to grow and grow further. Let me share something about electronic manufacturing, an area of my great passion, and in a department. <clears throat> when we had come to power in 2014, India had only two mobile factories. Now, India has closed to 260. We wanted, India has become the second biggest mobile manufacturer in the world. I was, now I am pushing that India should surpass China. That's my goal. I am very clear defining it. PLI is designed to propel India's stature, ease of doing business availability, leadership of the Prime Minister, a visionary leader, to showcase India as an alternative manufacturing uh, location. PLI which is production link incentive, 
is designed to enable global champion company to come to India and make Indian company national champion and competitive. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you it is basically export oriented. That come manufacture in India, export outside and earn the incentive. I announced this scheme in April 2020, height of COVID. The last day was 31st of July for filing the application, again height of COVID. And we received uh, top five global champion company came to India, including for component for mobile manufacturing, including five Indian companies. They have collectively committed to manufacture mobile phone and component worth 10 lakh crore in the coming five years giving jobs to 3 lakhs Indian directly and 6 lakhs indirectly. Production has already started. Many big plants have already been located from outside. All the major players of, in the field of mobile manufacturing are already here. Other PLI we have already worked about. Now my focus is India to emerge as a big center of manufacturing of other important electronic gadgets which have become integral to our day-to-day -day existence that is from laptop to tablets to servers and that whole ecosystem from mobile to server to everything is developing very fast and india has not i have not the slightest doubt go to noida and Greater noida close to 19 c factories are there itself of mobile and others that's how the whole vision is there and I intend to push it with great speed. That is my assurance to PT friends. What's the future? The future is two. One is AI, the other is data. The Prime Minister is very keen that artificial intelligence must become an important focus of our governance. But artificial intelligence should also be used again with inclusive character in mind namely we must have care for agriculture concrete weather forecasting education farming and healthcare we must leverage for all this uh, these areas in ai but i am i am never in doubt that while artificial intelligence is artificial mind, it must have connect with the human mind and human ethics. That should be our clear focus. Driverless car excites me as an IT minister, but gives me concern as a law minister. That if a driverless car causes accident, who will be responsible? The machine or the owner? These are challenges which we have to meet. As far as data is concerned, data is really going to determine the future course of digital discourse. Indians produce data by billions. There is public data available. And I'm very keen to develop India as a robust data economy of the world. Data refinery. And when I say data refinery, I mean data cleaning data refinement, data innovation, obviously taking good care of data privacy as well. And uh, I see this whole flow of data and all the ancillary initiatives required with the data economy is going to become a very important area of digital growth. I'm very happy that in India data centers are emerging. Very recently, I will open the second biggest data center in Mumbai, developed by a well-known real estate company. Our data protection law is currently being examined by the Parliament's Select Committee. <clears throat> we have formulated it after detailed discussions. The clear focus is element of consent of individual is important who you take data. The data fiduciary must clearly work within the limits of the consent. We are all working for 
creating the enabling atmosphere for data processing as well, including data flow between countries, again with proper element of consent. And obviously, it can be individual consent, it can be a group consent. But I'm very clear that the billions of data which we furnished is going to be of great help in promoting India's data economy in a very, very substantial way. But yes, as I always say, let me repeat it today as well, India is a big country, India is a democratic country, and we shall never compromise on our data sovereignty. We are quite open for data reciprocity, data exchange, but that has to be within a framework which is transparent, which is known, and which is clearly uh, laid down a very uh, objective ground rule under which we have to operate. Uh, I am quite sure as UPI has succeeded, as GSTN has succeeded, as digital healthcare is working on the ground, as Aadhaar has worked as a digital identity to supplement the system. Similarly, in the data economy also, India has a great future to ultimately convey to the world. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I had, when I had taken charge of this department and when Digital India started, we had two challenges before us. I'd like to share that before you. The first was challenge and also opportunity. Indian IT firms have done very well in servicing the global digital ecosystem, 500 fortune companies. That was there. What road Digital India must take? Then as I said in the very beginning, Digital India will have two components, empowerment and inclusion. And let me tell you, apart from the digital delivery of services, today India has become the second biggest startup movement in the world, or third probably. Now I'm taking this whole system, ecosystem, to the hinterland of India, to the kasbahs of India, the small towns of India. BPOs in many small towns have started working. Now I have come with a new scheme, Chunoti. What is Chunoti? To tap innovators in the small towns of India. Give them exposure to venture capital, to market, to assistance of law, and also giving them 25 lakh, lakh rupees of seed money to proper selection. So that from young people, from villages, from Gram Panchayat to small towns, who have a dream, unke khab hai, unke khab ko punk milne chahiye, digital punk ko ke, ye meri soch hai. And that we have already finalized, you may have seen also in video conferencing, we have selected India's talent, they have given award, many of them have started working also. So this whole ecosystem is working, whereby this digital empowerment with inclusive character in focus must remain our main objective. And I'm very happy that whether it is electronic manufacturing, whether it is digital in, uh, infrastructure, whether it is uh, promotion of entrepreneurs through startups, all are working very well. And I'm very keen that the PM's focus of gender justice should also remain an important pillar for digital initiative. As you all know, in our uh, IT sector, uh, close to 4 million people work directly, and nearly, uh, I would say, 1 crore 25 lakh one, uh, work indirectly. But what I'm happy to share with you, that one third are women. Similarly, our common service center also. Large number of women entrepreneurs are working in the hinterland of India, running digital kiosks. Many of them are hardly school dropouts. But I said, no, go ahead. Learn to play with the mouse and see the world and their delivery. So we are very, very happy to share with you that gender justice, woman empowerment is also becoming an important component of India's digital initiative. Right from the top down to the bottom.
So ladies and gentlemen, these are some of my initiatives I thought I must share with you as to what is the future digital ecosystem. We responded well in the challenge of COVID and we have a clear vision for the future. And I have not the slightest doubt that with the success we have achieved, the road of future is full of hope and also achievement. My greetings once again to my friends in the FIKI. I always look forward to sharing my ideas in FIKI's annual conferences. And it's always a pleasure to meet old friends and renew contacts. Thank you. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Thank you, Rai Bahu. You are so popular and so erudite. There is a flood of questions which await you. <laughs> my only problem is if I continue with the questions, Mr. Dilip Chenoa will murder me and will never allow me to speak because <laughs> the next session is starting at 9 30. So, may I request uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy to propose the vote of thanks? I am willing to take some questions. I am, I am available. No problem. No. <laughs> the timing is yours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, good morning and namaste. It is our greatest pleasure and privilege to have had you with us and to hear your thought-provoking and inspiring address. Your presence is, as always, a source of motivation and your message of empowerment, inclusion, uh, continues to be most inspiring. <clears throat> On the aspect of inclusion, we have a tremendous initiative called the Greater 50 uh, to assist women, and we will uh, be with you from FIKI to discuss this further and seek your help. But I want to begin by thanking you for your policy, for the speed of the government, which has enabled all of us to work from home comfortably, which has kept the nation running in so many ways. Uh, your work on the Aragyu Setu app, showing how technology can really play such a crucial role and the continued role for creating the digital infrastructure of this country so that we may become digital and beyond. Use AI to one day enable technology to assist uh, what was beautifully encapsulated to say that the routine gets automated and the complex can be more humanized. And that is the journey on which we are going, sir, with your thoughts and your assistance. Our startup initiative will definitely love to work with Chinauti. Uh, I cannot keep congratulating you for all the wonderful things you've done from CSCs, which we've worked closely with, but many also have made a big difference. I'll just conclude with a very big thank you, with a continued assurance that FIKI will always love to work with you and your ministry, uh, that our incoming president today, uh, Mr. Uday Shankar, who knows the space well, uh, is very keen to continue working with you. And also one word of congratulations on the tremendous initiative of electronic manufacture in the country, which again, we're very inspired with this, uh, my thanks and my uh, the, the the fact that we truly look forward to a continued association because with you and your ministry lie the key to India's beauty and growth. Thank you so much, sir. Namaste.